Can they switch this now? Huh? You want them to do mm. I don't think they can. Right? Are you purchasing with this? No, with this. Uh, I prefer without it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll run it to them because God knows what is here. You see my point? <laughs> So, um, Secure, security. Security. The, the funny thing is that I'm used to look here and you have to look there now. It's good that we have this screen. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Sorry. So, we're going to get started on. Interia, welcome, Interia at IETF 99. Blue sheets are going around both sides, so please uh, make sure you register your agenda. Your dear chairs, Wasim and myself. Hello, everyone. Uh, there's a new note well that you have already learned by heart at this time of the week, so we encourage you to keep reading it and uh, be aware of, of uh, the differences. Basically, you have to uh, disclose any IPR related to any discussion, communication, etc. that uh, happens during this meeting that you may be aware of. Um, so we have a minute taker. Uh, the meeting is recorded. Uh, we will get the, the scribe to get the, the notes eventually to the etherpad. Uh, and uh, everything, of course, is public. So once again, please go with the blue sheets uh, when you see them. Um, do you ha we have a we have blue sheets going around. We have note taker. Do we have a jobber scribe or someone that could volunteer to to help us with the jobber? Just for the Q and A part. Anyone? Yeah. Please. Anyone that is willing to stand up? No, yeah, thank you. Thanks. We got to. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. So moving on to the agenda, uh, we're going to give you a quick update uh, on the working group documents and where we stand. Uh, then uh, Ron is going to give us his uh, speech about Probe, which is a APING, the old APING. Now it's called Probe, and it's been accepted. Uh, congestion notification uh, tunnels uh, with Bob. Uh, Tal is going to talk about guidelines and for packet, discovering provisioning domains, uh, Eric, and MPT network layer from Gabor, and SOX uh, V6 uh, from Vladimir. Um, on our status update, uh, the privacy considerations for IP broadcast and multicast protocol designers, well, if you remember, that, that document got ac accepted. So uh, Shepard has been assigned. That's myself, actually. So, so I'm going to be shepherding the document now. Uh, on the generic UDP encapsulation, uh, it's been updated to version 4, but the authors... Uh, uh, no, no, sorry. So the, the only update is uh, it's moved uh, from uh, version 1 to version 4. Uh, no presentation planned for this time. Um, on the IP, we're intentionally partitionally, partially partitioned links. Uh, we adopted the document as of last time, so it now uh, it's now a working group document. Uh, again, no no presentation. Probe got adopted, but we will hear uh, an update uh, from Ron directly. And IP tunnels in the Internet architecture, um, we decided on the list to move it uh, uh, in the shape of BCP, but the authors uh, did not have a chance to to make an update before this meeting, so they will uh, do so after the meeting, and we will continue the discussion on the mailing list. So, uh, I guess the next one is Ron. Yeah. 
Yeah, of course. Okay. Welcome to Thursday morning in a cold, dark room. Um, I'll try to wake everybody up. You've heard this presentation before under different names. Uh, first time I came here, it was called Leaping. Then we had to change it to Xping. Then we found somebody else had used that. So now it's called Probe. One thing that's changed significantly is the name. <laughs> a feature has been added. And just to make sure that you're all awake in this cold, dark room on Thursday morning, when you see the new feature, raise your hand. And then I'll know if people are awake. Anyhow, let's dive in. Um, Probe is a utility that feels something like Ping, but a little bit better. Let's go on to the first slide. And let's talk about your old buddy, Ping. Ping tests bi-directional connectivity between a probing interface and a probed interface. Probing interface sends an ICMP uh, echo request to the probed interface. If the probed interface gets the request, he sends back an ICMP echo reply. And if the reply makes it all the way to, back to the probing interface, we declare success. Otherwise, we declare failure. Now, something about ping, ping doesn't always exercise the probed interface. The echo request may come in the probe node through a different interface, and it, the echo reply may leave the probe node through an interface other than the probe. So what, first thing you have to disavow yourself of, of is the notion that we're exercising the probed interface. Next slide. Ping has two failures. Uh, not two failures. It, it does what it does. It has two shortcomings, though. One is it can't distinguish among the following failures. Maybe the echo request got lost on the way to the probe node. Maybe the probe, probed interface is down. Maybe the probed interface is up, but the echo reply got lost on the way back to the probing interface. In any case, when you look at ping, all you know is that the echo reply didn't make it back to you. You don't know why. The other is that ping requires bi-directional reachability between the probing and the probed interfaces. So there are some times when you just can't use ping. For instance, when the probed interface is unnumbered, when the probing interface is IPv4 only and the probing is IPv6 only or vice versa. So with probe, we're going to try to overcome the shortcomings you see on this slide. Next slide. <coughs> so. Let's talk about probe. What makes probe different is it distinguishes between a proxy and a probed interface. What happens here is the probing interface sends an ICMP echo request to a proxy interface. That's a new ICMP message. The extended ICMP echo request identifies the probed interface by address, IF name, or IF index. So we're making a distinction here. There's a probing interface, the guy who's sending the echo request. He's sending it to a proxy, and the echo request has in it, in its payload, something that identifies the probed interface. The proxy and the probed interfaces are different from any, well, one another. The proxy interface receives the extended echo request, determines the status of the probed interface, and returns an ICMP echo reply. And the echo reply reports the status of the probed interface. Now, this probed interface, it can reside on the same node as the proxy interface. So say the proxy is the loopback on, uh, on a router, and the probed interface is any other interface on the router. It can also be directly connected to the node upon which the proxy uh, interface resides. So let's say for a moment that you send your uh, your echo, extended echo request to the loopback on a PE router, you can ask for the status of a CE interface that's directly connected to the PE router. No hands go up. Everybody's sleeping. That, that was the new thing. I know. Oh, man. Next time I'll have fireworks. Next slide. Okay. How do we determine the status of the probed interface? Well, if the probe interface is on the same node as the proxy interface, it's easy. You do exactly what you would do to determine uh, the IF opera status in MIB2. If the probed interface is directly connected, if it's not local to the proxy interface, what you, uh, what you do is take a look in either your ARP table or your neighbor cache. If the address appears, then you say, oh, yep, 
that that interface must be there. If the address do doesn't appear, you assume that the interface does not exist, and you send that kind of response back. Next slide. So um, let's take a look at some of the differences between probe and ping. Probe tests two things. First, it tests bidirectional connectivity between the probing interface and the proxy. If you don't have that, probe won't get a reply. The next thing it tests is the status of the probed interface. If the probed interface is down, you get a reply, and the reply says the probed interface is down. If the probed interface is up, the reply says the probed interface is up. The other thing it gives you is, given bidirectional connectivity to any interface on a node, probe can query the status of any other interface on the node or any interface that's directly connected to the node. Next slide. Okay, um, we've talked about this mysterious new ICMP message. Here's a few details about it. Um, like any ICMP message, it has an IP header. The destination address is the proxy interface. You always send the packet to the proxy. In the ICMP body, the type is to be determined by uh, IANA. There's a code, a checksum, an identifier, and a sequence number, and they're all the same as the traditional ICMP echo request. The only difference is that the sequence number is only 8 bits long, and that's to make room for an L flag. The L flag tells you whether the probed interface is local to the box or directly connected to the box. And it has an extension structure that identifies the probed interface. Next slide. Okay. The, uh, the extension structure has one or two interface identification objects. Um, they identify the probed interface either by name, address, or IF index. And if it does it by address, it can be any address type. So let's say for a minute you sent a ICMP v4 packet to a uh, IPv4 only loopback address, you can be asking about a interface that is IPv6 only and identifying it by its IPv6 address. Maybe it's IPv6 link local address. Now, this link local thing brings up the kicker. You might have two interfaces with the same link local address on a box, so sometimes you need two interface identification objects to uniquely identify a probed interface. Next slide. Um, the extended echo reply returns exactly two pieces of information, operational status and what protocols are active on the interface. It doesn't return anything else. This isn't meant to be an SNMP uh, get on the, uh, all the attributes of the box. It just returns two things. It's a ping lookalike. Next slide. Okay, use cases. Why did we go through all this? Well, the use case I was thinking about when we started this is I wanted people to use more probe, uh, unnumbered interfaces. And the reason I wanted to do that was to reduce the attack surface of a router. Also wanted to make provisioning easier so you don't have to manage all these addresses. Um, that, was, that was the driving one. But then more things came up. For instance, what if the probing and probing Probe, no, what if the proxy and probed interfaces are different address types? One's IPv4, one's IPv6. Or what if you just don't have a route to the probed interface? You only have a route to the proxy. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's what this looks like. We have an implementation, um, and it looks strangely like ping. You know, the, the word is probe. Here we're querying by name, so it's minus interface and the name of an interface. And the 10.10.10.2 is the proxy address. And you get something back that looks like a ping. Next slide. Here another one. We're querying an interface by its uh, link local address. Next slide. OK, lots of security uh, possibilities here, lots of security considerations. You can use probe to discover things about a box. For instance, you can use it to discover uh, if you find that it has an interface called GE hyphen zero slash zero slash zero, you can infer a lot of things about that box, like who the vendor is, maybe what version of code it's running, maybe what the bandwidth or MTU of the uh, interface is. So you may not want to open probe up to anybody. Next slide. So what are the mitigations? Well, for a node, by default, it doesn't honor ICMP extend, extended echo requests. If it does honor them, 
the query types are enabled one at a time. By default, they're all disabled. So you would have to enable um, ICMP echo uh, requests and only queries by address, not queries by name, if that's what you want. And further, for each type that you enable, you can specify which source addresses you will accept the query from. So that way you're sure that, you know, if you get a query, you know it's from your own NMS or you know it's from inside your own network. You know, you can, you can enforce whatever security policy you want. Next slide. Okay, the status. We've had many rounds of this, um, many comments, thanks to Jeff Haas, uh, Somini, um, Jonathan Looney, Carlos Pinatero. Um, we have a new feature, thanks to Med Bocadere. Uh, um, Med, you didn't jump up when you heard your own feature. I'm, I'm heartbroken. And we have a working prototype, thanks to Reggie Thomas, which brings us to our next slide. I think we're probably ready for working group last call. Um, what do other folks feel? But first, questions. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, comment on the IF name handling. Um, one thing I was trying to look up and didn't have a chance to before you got uh, there is uh, that I I'm inferring an answer based on the text of the document which says that it can be UTF-8. Um, yes. By that, I'm inferring that it's not constrained to the ASCII character set. Yes, in the text okay. of the draft, yeah. it does say UTF-8. Okay. So okay. what that means is that your draft is currently underspecified, and it does not guarantee your operability, and it's easy to fix. So uh -huh. right now it says UTF-8, but it does not discuss normalization form. And so you need to do one of two things, or perhaps both. You need to either say that the sender has to normalize and put it in a particular normalization form like NFC, or you have to say that the receiver must accept anything and do normalization itself. Otherwise, the lack of interoperability happens if the sender just puts it in whatever its natural normalization form is, the sender does a byte for byte comparison against its internal app representation, and they use different normalization forms, and you get a failure. And that's what can happen today, and you conform it to the specs. So you gotta, you got to solve that problem to get interoperability. Okay, in this area, I'm absolutely naive. If you could send me a quick paragraph, uh, I'll put it in there. E either of those two solutions work. You either say the client has to normalize, uh -huh. or, uh, you know, or the server has to normalize. Okay. Or in theory, you could do you know both for redundancy, but it, you know. Okay, I'll get with you offline and post that before okay. the sun comes down tonight. Right. The second part, which is a variation of the same thing, is you say uh, if the IF name was longer than 255 octets, you truncate at 255 octets. Yes. The problem with that is when you truncate a UTF string at 255 octets, what you get is a non-UTF-8 string, because you can be truncating right in the middle of a character, and so you can't do that. Ooh. And so if you're going to truncate, you have to truncate on a character boundary, which is not at 255 octets. It's at uh, 255 octets truncated what, zero or to two more bytes in order to get to the character boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'll corner you offline. We'll craft text, and we'll have it posted by the end of the day. Any other questions? <laughs> Any other questions? So it goes back to the last slide and the ask for a working group last call. We'll do that on the menu, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Hello. Um, yeah. Here we go. Uh, no, actually, we don't have, you have to tell, ask me. <laughs> Please, you have a point. I am your point. <laughs> Is that okay? No, I've got one in the back. Laser. The laser? You have it? No. This one doesn't have it? I don't know. It does. Okay. Hi there. All right. Um, I was here about a year ago. I'm not here, here, but um, in this working group. Um, this is a draft that's um, being fast-tracked through TSBWG, um, intended to go to last call, working group last call, um, in October now. Um, so we want eyes on this because it actually updates interior protocols. Um, next. So um, this is what the problem is. I've now labeled this problem number one because there's another problem. 
But the main one is that um, when you're tunneling IP headers, um, you ECN is unlike any other field in that not only um, does it have to go down the layers as you encapsulate, and not only can it change once it's down the layers, but then you also have to propagate the change back up the layers, right? And there is no other field like that, as far as I know. Um, and so at the egress, shown in that little table that's deliberately too small to read, is a, is a matrix that's already in RFC 6040 of what the outer header is, what the inner header is, and how you calculate the um, forwarded header. Then um, the problem is, on the last bullet, main bullet of those three, um, if the decap, as shown, where's the, that one? If the decap here, shown in white, does not support that function, you must zero the ECM field before you put it into the tunnel, because otherwise, if you have just copy the ECN field, and there are ECN capable um, machines, network elements along here that mark it, those markings will not get propagated back up, they'll just get dropped on the floor when it decapsulates, and then all hell breaks loose. Um, and all hell breaks loose means um, your, your load into the tunnel is um, potentially loading up a, a buffer, that buffer is growing, um, but rather than seeing drops, the congestion markings that are being generated by that are just being thrown on the floor, and so the load just keeps getting bigger until it overloads that buffer, and then um, the, the host will respond because they'll see the drops, and it will oscillate between short queue and long queue continually, and you'll get a very horrible network. So um, the problem with this is, and we only realized this recently, that we specified that tunnel behavior for nodes that want to com comply with ECN. But the problem is this requirement is for nodes whether or not they comply with ECN. All, all tunnel nodes have to do this. This is not just if you want to comply with ECN. And so what we've had to do is make this a um, requirement for operators to configure it, not just for implementers, right? Um, so we certainly want you, you, you guys to review this and certainly any operators in the room to review whether that is feasible because what it actually means is if you've got to be able to configure it to zero the ECN field, you would think that's quite easy, but it's not if your implementation still thinks that this ECN field, which is two bits, is actually part of the TOS byte because that was what your grandfather told you when the internet was first built and, and your implementer read it in some TCP IP guide on the internet rather than looking at the latest RFCs because ECN has been there now for 16 years, but people are still thinking it's a TOS byte with eight bits in it. And so quite often you'll find like say L2TP tunnels treat that as a TOS byte and the configuration of the diff serve um, behavior can be configured, but it treats the two bits and the six bits as just eight bits and it can't treat them differently. So we've put a, a very strong requirement in there. Implementations must decouple ECN and, and DIFSO copoint configuration, because otherwise operators can't even do that. So there's you know, potentially a big problem here. Not a problem at all if there's nothing inside the network that's, um, support, that, that's actually marking ECN, but those sort of nodes are now appearing. We're starting to see that appear on the internet. If you, if you look in the measurement MapRG group, they are starting to see it appear and generally your tunnel may not know what is inside the network that it's tunneling over. Okay, so um, important. Now, what this draft was originally trying to solve was the problem that RFC 6040 that defines the behavior of tunnels and ECN, um, it wasn't potentially clear what the scope was. Um, it said all IP in IP tunnels and um, this, update clarifies that that includes IP and IP with stuff in between, with shims, with layer two and shims and so on. So um, this is the outers on the bottom here. I'm going to call this IP shim 
possibly layer two and possibly IP inside, but if you don't necessarily know whether IP is inside, if, if you're, um, you don't want to have to look that deep. But if you don't know, you have to zero the outer IP in case there is an IP header inside. Right. So we had a look through um, and surveyed what standards track RFCs we've got that are like this, IP shim IP or IP shim layer two IP. And um, you guys have obviously been busy. Um, this isn't all Interior's fault, but there clearly is a management problem here somewhere <laughs> in that I'm sure we don't need all these protocols, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> to all do essentially the same thing. Um, Obviously, there are differences. Uh, you know, that's a, a broad brush statement. But um, so, what this quickly, what this table does, um, we've had to ignore anything that's not widely deployed or st standards track. So, anything with a cross there, where, where there'll, there'll be no other entry in the table. Um, AOK means it specifies what to do with the ECN headers, and we're fine. I'll come on to what the exceptions mean. Um, no K, not OK, there's two possibilities. One is that this draft, we have written update text into this draft. And the other is that it's not an IETF tunneling protocol. It, maybe there's an IETF RFC. Um, but um, we're not in control of it. So I want you guys to look, if we can just pop back to the last slide. Teredo, GRE, LTTP v3. Um, the LTTP guys are reviewing that. The one that I've had no comments back on is GRE. Had no response to my emails on that. Um, and it's obviously quite important. Um, ne next slide, because I've got a question on that. Or do you want to, is it, do you want to wait until the end or? I'll wait till the end. Yeah, OK. Um, so a lot of work on this, because we're fast tracking it. Um, four revisions since the last cycle, thanks to all those people there. Um, I've, I've said what the milestone is. Um, I guess, I think we've agreed to uh, last call it, David, with Intera, yeah? And um, I'll carry on talking while you come to the mic. Um, the three questions I've got, in that table it says um, SFC um, is, is not applicable because they haven't defined an actual encapsulation. Is that true? And the second question is, is it true that there are no automated GRE tunnel setup protocols? Because I can't find any, but you guys should know where there is, and no one in TSV knew this. And Teredo, I'm, I'm dealing with that with um, uh, Praveen in Microsoft. So um, let's go for a question. Uh, Mike. <coughs> Tom is Rahi, Marvel. Uh, so there was some discussion about this in the NVO3 mailing list, uh, mainly regarding VXLAN and Geneva. Yeah. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the way I understand it is that actually each uh, uh, RFC that defines an encapsulation over IP, uh, an IP encapsulation will need to define, uh, to have a section that says um, what happens in terms of uh, ECN propagation, right? Yeah. And so my question is, uh, would it be possible in this draft to define a small set of options, uh, like for example, the way to propagate ECN is option one, option two, option three, option yeah, four, and then that's, al that's already in the base spec. This up just, up just updates that to say, uh, to, to this is basically this this draft is, exists merely to put update text in for protocols that legacy protocols that all need to be updated to point to that spec and say what you have to specifically do for those legacy protocols, like L2TP, GRE, things like that. In the original spec, there's two modes, and exactly what you want. There's compatibility mode and uh, normal mode. Right. And the compatibility mode is the zeroing the outer. And that's right. all you need to do. So and actually, what you're expecting from Geneva is to define we're going to support option X from draft ECN shim? Yeah. OK, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's easy, it's just you, I mean, for instance, in VXLAN, it's actually now in the Linux code, but it's not in the spec. Sri Gundagal, Cisco. 
On the second bullet point, so to your question, you know, is there a protocol that sets up the GA tiles? Yeah. If you look at it, mobile IPv4, mobile IPv6, proxy mobile IPv6, IQ2, they're all control plane protocols that result in creation of a GRE tunnel center. So, right. so, but do they, so, do they sort of um, negotiate capabilities of the tunnel endpoints? Absolutely, GRE keys right. and many other parameters are okay. negotiated. So they're the place where they need to say, one end needs to say, does the other end support ECN decapsulation so I can put ECN encapsulation in? Yeah. Right. We have to yeah. look at all of these protocols, control protocols, see what we have. You know, we have considerations on how to create GRE tunnels. Right. We have to look at those, uh, look at the text and say how to, you know, whether the text is, you know, goes with, you know, yeah. or further updates are needed. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, so uh, David, if you, if you're okay with this, like, I think it's no problem, like last calling it here as well. So just David Black, uh, TSVWG chair. Yeah, we're going to last call this uh, where, wherever it is. Uh, what I got up to say was that the earlier discussion about options, let's just double check that we've got all the right text on this and the options in the tunnels draft because people aren't going to come looking for this ECN specific draft when they put it in the next tunnel, but we hope they're going to go read the tunnels BCP. And so we need to make sure that they're, that, that they're I think, I'm pretty sure uh, Joe's got 6040 text in there, but I think we need to go check that, make sure it's right, make sure it offers guidance to implementers and possibly operators about what has got to be done to not lose congestion indications. Okay, thank you. Ron Bonica, Juniper. Could you go back to the slide with the great big table? No, 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 no the, the great table. That one. MPLS isn't in that list. Should it be? No, because MPLS is, is already covered in the original draft. This is an update to cover all, all these okay. other things. The, the RFC 5129 already does ECN and MPLS, yeah. And just general IP and IP without a shim isn't in this table for the same reason. Okay. Thank you. Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. My name is Tal Mizrahi. I'm from Orville. And this draft defines guidelines for specifying packet timestamp format. It's joint work with Joachim Fabini and with Al Morton. Um, and actually, this draft is submitted to the Interia Working Group. It was also presented this week in TikTok and NTP. Um, we'll talk a bit later on about uh, which working group is the right place for it. Next, please. So in general, timestamps are pretty useful in the RFC series. They've been used in a lot of RFCs. We distinguish between two main types of timestamps, text-based timestamps and packet timestamps. So here's an example of a text-based timestamp for a net, netconf RPC in this case. And there's also an example of a packet timestamp. This is the NTP packet format. The main difference is that text-based timestamps are intended to be more user-friendly uh, they don't necessarily have a fixed length. And uh, packet timestamps have a fixed length. They need to be compact. They need to fit into a packet header. Next, please. So like I said, text-based timestamps are used in a lot of RFCs, and their, their format is defined in RFC 3339. Um, and these are a few examples. There are a lot of other examples of RFCs that use these text-based formats. Uh, packet timestamps are also very widely used. This is, again, a short list of some of the RFCs that use it. Next, please. And there are also a lot of internet drafts that are currently in progress, which also use uh, packet timestamps. Now, the main issues that uh, we're trying to address here, first of all, there is no common timestamp format for the packet timestamp variant. That's one issue. And the second issue is that a lot of these drafts or RFCs define their own uh, packet timestamp formats. And now the problem is that the way these formats are defined are sometimes very different from each other. And uh, 
In many cases, the timestamp is defined in a somewhat unclear way or ambiguous. So these are the main problems we're trying to deal with. Next, please. So the goal of this draft, first of all, to define a relatively small set of recommended packet timestamp formats, and also to define guidelines of how to specify new packet timestamp formats. Next, please. So these are basically the uh, recommended timestamp formats that we're currently uh, presenting in the draft. So we have two formats which are based on NTP, a 64-bit format and a 32-bit format. And there's also a 64-bit uh, format which is based on PTP. And the idea is that if uh, you're going to use a timestamp in a network protocol that typically runs on a PC or on a server, you'll often want to integrate that with NTP. And then you often want to use an NTP-based format. And on the other hand, if you're going to implement a network protocol uh, that typically runs on hardware, uh, or sometimes PTP is used, it makes more sense to use a PTP-based timestamp format. Next, please. Okay, so we expect that in most cases, the timestamp formats we saw on the previous slide will fit most scenarios, most requirements. However, in some cases, we understand that um, people will have different requirements, will want to define a new timestamp format. So in these cases, uh, these are recommended guidelines or uh, actually a template of how to define a timestamp format. And the template consists, first of all, of specifying uh, the field format, the number of bits, the units, if the timestamp consists of a few subfields, then we need for each of these subfields to define these properties. Then there's also the epoch, which means uh, when the time starts, for example, 1st of January 1970. Any considerations related to wrap around, like uh, when the timestamp is going to wrap around, and also any considerations related to synchronization, whether we expect the endpoints to be synchronized and to what level. Next, please. Another aspect that is discussed in this draft is an optional control field. So in a lot of cases, if you're using a packet timestamp, you will need some control information about that timestamp. So for example, that control information can include what the timestamp format is, what is the precision or resolution of the timestamp, what is the epoch, the error, and we're actually looking for feedback about what kind of a control information you believe may be required in this uh, aspect. Next, please. Okay, so this draft, the first version of this draft was submitted in the last month or so. We submitted it to the Internet Area Working Group. One of the things we were looking for is feedback about what is the uh, correct working group to uh, consider the uh, this draft, and uh, the feedback we re received from Suresh was that probably the best way or the best place to discuss this would be in uh, TikTok and NTP. Um, also at this point, like I said, we're looking for any kind of feedback specifically about what kind of control information you believe uh, should be included in the optional control field, and uh, any comments would be appreciated. Um, a special bonus to anyone who has counted the number of times I said timestamp in the last few minutes. Not everyone at once, please. Hi. In TCPM, um, there's currently work on uh, just starting on um, redefining the TCP <laughs> timestamp, or, or at least. Um, agreeing on various timers at either end, and then you have to agree the clock granularity and things like that. So I, uh, the units you've got there, is, are you using a standardized format for that, or are you having to invent a, a format for units? Because that's the big problem. It's, it's what resolution is each end talking about. Okay, that's a good question to consider. At this yeah. point, we just specified you need to say what the units are. Um, one thing to think about would be to have kind of options you need to choose from. Um, right. Point to consider. Yeah, because 
you know, clock granny, a lot of the timestamps um, in the past were in sort of millisecond type granularity, and we're now needing sub nanosecond, you know, and, and, and so you, you've got a, one problem is you need more bits because the wrap is, is um, greater because you've got more um, packets on the wire at any one time, but the other problem is what is the resolution that you're talking about at each end? Right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Bob, is there a draft for this? Um, well, the latest one is Google's um, low latency TCP option, but um, there was one previously from Richard Scheffenegger, which has expired now. I'll have to I'll put it on the list. Okay, send me a note. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Uh, Gabriel Montenegro. So um, I did notice that you had on the list of existing work uh, document out of six slow working group and um, I'm wondering if you're gonna operate in a sort of like MIB doctor and be packet uh, for you know timestamp doctor type thing because so I would like to to ask you for a review for that as working group co-chair of six slow um, um, it would be good to have uh, your review on that document on the six slow document it's already listed there the six slow uh, Lijo six low expiration time, whatever. So it's not, it's got elements of timestamp there, although the purpose is more expiration time, but I'm sure you, we would benefit from, you know, you guys looking at it. Thank okay, you. thanks. Okay, thank you, Todd. Thanks. Eric? Preferably not. <laughs> Mad USB. Okay, good morning. So my name is Rick Ving, presenting the second ref of this draft. It has already been presented this week uh, by Pierre at Sixman, because it has an impact on the IPv6 protocol, as well as by Tommy and the Captive Portal Working Group, I think it was yesterday. In short, what you are trying to solve is partly multi-homing for IPv6 and others. Nowadays networks, when you have a host, like the laptop which is here, it can of course be connected by multiple ways. You can have your phone doing tethering with the mobile data. You can be connected by Wi-Fi, by Ethernet, so two different interfaces going to the same access network, which is itself connected to two networks, one being your normal ISP and one being your VPN provider, back to home. So now, if you have an application there, which addresses and which interface do you use? Next slide. So basically, in the legacy world, which means you know the stuff called IPv4 with dotted addresses? You select one interface only, and you go. And you use NAT to ensure that the traffic is coming back through the same network. But typically, that's not what we want to do in V6. Next. In the case of multi-homing for V6, you will get provider readable or provider assigned addresses from all service providers. So in the case of the previous slide, you will get three prefixes, and you can select as many addresses among those three prefixes. And again, it's bare minimum three. Some reference there. Now, the question is that all the application, all the host, can select one or several, in the case of multipath CCP, addresses, which is the next stop, which is the DNS resolver I'm using, and so on and so on. So that's basically the problem we are trying to solve here. Next. And interestingly enough, this issue has been raised multiple times this week. So I don't think Marcus is in the room, but he presented this, um, I think, at V6Ops. There's the Microsoft IT network using their own addresses. So you see, <coughs> sorry, here, this is the prefix from Microsoft IT, but of course, Microsoft has got also cloud services, Azure, which is using from the same top global prefix. So now, if you have in the branch of Microsoft both 
connectivity to, I guess, some um, MPLS VPN or VPN, whatever, and connectivity to a local service provider, the host there will receive two prefixes, one from the Microsoft IT, one from the service provider. Source address selection in this case will work fine if you want to go to the internet, but if you want to go to the internet to reach any cloud services in Azure, guess what? You will select the address to go to the corporate network, and then you are into trouble. Nothing can be fixed really easily there. Next. Another one, and Ted, you are here. You presented this. When you have two interfaces, and also two interfaces you receive through array or DHCP or whatever, DNS resolvers addresses, you need to be sure that you are sending a request to a DNS resolver from that the address associated to this interface. Else, you will receive a reply which is not correct. Think about the geolocation, right? I'm connected to the VPN of my um, employer right now. He believes I'm in Amsterdam. And as far as I know, we are in Prague, right? So if I go there, ask an address to my VPN provider, I will be redirected to Akamai or Cloudflare in Amsterdam, not in Prague. There's a problem. Next. Another one, and Christian is here. I don't know whether Fernando is here. What about an application? I am, as a client, it's kind of easy. But if I am the listener, the server, if I do a bind and I want to listen to all addresses, hmm, but should I listen to all addresses or only part of the addresses? How can I select this? We need to expand there as well. Next. So in short, I wanted to prove you that there are use case, real problem. I mean, I was not aware that Ted and Christian and others will be presenting this this week. So that's a real problem to be addressed. What we want to do is to follow the RFC 7556 for PVDs, make them identify, and once you get the ID of the PVD, try to get more information pro about this provisioning domain. Right? Not limited to addresses, next up, and DNS information. Next. We focus on the current protocol, IPv6, and the way we design it to be very quick and efficient is to send this PVD ID option into a new router advertisement option. And we simply put there, we put some lifetime, but we put the fully qualified domain name. So something like, I don't know, pvd.iatf.org. Couple of flags. One which is important is the H, meaning that you can use HTTPS to get more information. The set of information into the array is limited, but you want to get more information, like pricing, is there a captive portal? Is there, is it a, a world garden network and so on and so on? Come back on this. And a L flag, which is mainly that you can bundle this V6 information with some IPv4 information you get through the HTTP v4. So how does it work? Next. The client on the left starts and you receive a route advertisement, including this option. If the client doesn't know this option, that's fair. It will get the array and will use it as usual. Now, if he knows the option, and if in the option there is the H standing for HTTP, it will simply go and to the specific URI where you use the PVD ID, which is in the array, dot well known slash PVD, and get the information. Next. By this HTTPS connection, and we use HTTPS on purpose here. Next. The additional information, which is fetched over this HTTPS connection, is a JSON file, very extensible. You can put whatever you want. Some example there. Uh, again, we can put information about World Garden. This is the no internet, whether it's free or not. Um, Captive portals, you can go directly there without waiting to be redirected. Could be useful if you don't get a user behind the, the mobile network. 
And if you want to try on your own, there is one which is there, and it will stay there for a while. Next. Now, assuming that the host here, over a single interface, but could have five or ten interfaces, receive multiple arrays, it will make bundles linked by this PVD ID. The bundles are the prefix, the route information, the next up, the DNS search list, and the DNS server. Because then we solve that problems, right? We always go by an interface using this address to go to this DNS server. We make those bundles. There are this kind of Venn diagrams here. And it's up to the host, or more probably to the application, to select whether you use any of those, like the Firefox and Safari here, or you use only the red bundle, like Skype, or you use the green bundle, like um, VLC here. Next. Where are we? This is actually very easy to implement. Right? This is just another array option. You need to change the semantics into the stack, which is a little bit more complex. There are open source code. So Pierre and myself are working on this with another guy in Paris, where basically we work on Linux. So the Linux client receiver is there with patches. We have built a Wireshark dissector, so we can display all those options of the Wireshark. We modify the IP route, we modify array DVD. And in this IATF hackathon over the weekend, a couple of us were there. We added the support in OpenWRT already. Tommy added the support on iOS. You can see already there, you don't display everything, but is it the normal iOS network selection? You see networks and there are three networks, meaning on one SSID, he was able to receive the three PVD and display them. That's what we did. And Tom Jones into the need project, and Dory is there as well, I made some integration with the need project, which is kind of a middleware at the transport layer. Next. And tonight, at the bits and bytes, please come and see us. Pierre and myself will be there. We can show you there how we make um, something working with the captive portal. Next. OK, last slide. Next step for us, we receive very useful feedback during the hackathon. So Pierre is currently working on it to uh, upload the dash 02, um, minus things like using a well-known URL rather than something else. Now, we really, really welcome, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here in this room today. We really want to get feedback. Oh, so who read it, by the way? Oh, oh, so something like 10 people. So all of you, please comment on the list on now, Sri. Yeah, Sri. So the question is, uh, in MIF working group, we had a couple of the MPVD documents. Right? One was NDP, one was DHCP. Those were working group documents. So I ask, what changed? They were killed, they didn't move forward, and suddenly we are, what, what's, the, what's the disconnect here between the two? I won't come back on the history, but this one only use array on good for good reason, because it's simple, right? And there is no blocking factor associated to it, to say it mindly. That, that's a that's too much of a detail, right? But 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 the key thing is to, at a very high level, those drafts tried to solve this problem. I think that's that's you know as a co-author, you know, as for at least two of those documents, right? I, I'm. We should either take those documents forward or somehow consolidate that work. That would be, you know, I'm not objecting to this. I like this work because prefix coloring is something that I started, actually. I introduced that term. Okay, so back six, seven years back, there were slides on that. But I want, I don't want the work to be wasted. But but you know, to be fair, that work needs to continue. And, and, and Sri, you are more than welcome to join us. On this. It's not just me, but it has to be consolidated. That's all my, my point. Okay, thank you. Element. So um, I definitely support this work. I'd like to see it go forward. Um, it's obviously Dead, we can useful. barely hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, so I definitely support this work. I think it should go forward. Um, it's really useful. Um, it's not complete in the sense that it doesn't solve 
all the problems that, that I think are problems. <laughs> um, were you were you in HomeNet when I made the presentation? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so you saw that. Yeah, so one of the things that this is missing that I think is actually important is a way for the host to signal that it supports it. Because, um, in fact, the network, if the network doesn't know that the host supports it, it really shouldn't be giving the host multiple prefixes because if it does, the host will experience um, bad behavior. Uh, so the, ho the network needs to pick a prefix for the host if it doesn't support PVDs. Um, I don't think that that means that, I, I think that this can go forward independently of what I just said. I don't think the two things are, that, that there's a, a cross requirement there, but I'd like to see work happen on that as well. Which does make sense. Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo Colivi, two, three is partly in response to three. So there were a few things that went wrong with MIF. One of them, of course, being that the working group was shot in the head. I still don't know how how that happened because it was, it, it basically happened overnight and ITFI wasn't there. It's like, okay, the working group has been closed. Have a nice day. All right, fine. Um, so, um, but the, really, I think this is a continuation of that story. Another thing that I have to say against those drafts that came out of MIF is that they try to do way too much with way too little OS vendor support. And that is not the case for these current efforts. I think we've got a uh, line of sight to actual implementers building this stuff. So, you know, the running code part of it is, is way more true here than it was then. Um, there was an IPR claim that we all stayed away from, uh, which was sort of, I don't know if that was part of the reason why the working group was closed. And so there, there are a number of things wrong that we think we did learn from. Uh, and so these efforts are, in some sense, a continuation of those. They're a little bit de-scoped, but probably more uh, more realistic in terms of actual implementation. I uh, see Dave nodding his head. So he's, uh, I think we have, I forget who the authors are here. I know it doesn't include any of us, but I think Apple maybe is, is yeah. an author. Are you, is that right? No? Um, it's remember. basically currently the author of Polytechnic Paris. Apple and Cisco. But oh, there you are. Yeah, we've so, been working on this as well. Right? Yeah. Many, many other people are working on it. I, I think, think Lorenzo Three's point was the previous work was not acknowledged, if I understand correctly. Um, oh, that we, I see, I see. Ronnie Vols, uh, I want to just follow up on Ted that I think you do need to consider, you know, either doing what Ted suggested or at least documenting what the impact is of sending these these RAs with PVDs to devices that don't understand them, right? That that will just process them as normal RAs, or I, I forget. I think that's what would happen. I mean, there we simply we we've done it, right? So uh, come with your device uh, tonight at the bits and byte, uh, Bernie, and you will be on one SSID sending three RAs with three different PVDs. Uh, it will ignore the PVD options. It will configure the three prefixes. Right. But it's, it's, already there. it's there, yeah, 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 oh, it's there. Okay, I missed it, I guess. There is the host behavior which defines it. Okay, hey, um, go to the RA slide. If Sorry, you can't, RA slide. Oh, too late, or? Yep, oh, back yeah. one. So, I, this, I mean, I think this is interesting work. Um, what the thing that I'm sort of wonder is, I mean, this is, putting stuff in an RA that causes you to then look up a fully qualified domain name, if I'm reading that right, and open, you know, and do a web browser thing to get some information. No, no, not a web browser at all. It can be fully automated. No, no, I mean, so you're going to a web server. That's correct. Right. That's correct. So this has got all kinds, I think, kinds of failure. There's a whole bunch of dependencies in order for that to work. And I think, I wonder if this might, this approach might be very fragile. It, kind of true, but when you say the age, I don't remember the explicit wording we use into the draft. We say when you see the age, you should get back the additional information. The additional information is not really critical compared to routing or to addressing. But you're right. If we cannot get the yeah. additional information, I mean, there's an I, the IB wrote a paper on you know trying to trying to have all kinds of dependencies which cause failures, and this has got a lot of them built into its design. So you might think about that. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. And another thing, Bob, like that I stated is that like anything that does something with an RA gets six man review. So just like in case you're wondering, uh, Eric Klein, if I could respond. 
one of the reasons to put it into, into, the, into the RA is to bind all the minimum required amount of information, the addresses, the routes, and the DNS. But I, can, I didn't understand the problem then. Well, let, let me take another take of uh, Bob's problem statement. A question, Ritema. Uh, what you have there is a signal that says to the host, go to that website, connect to it, and go fetch a page. If you do that with a normal HTTP stack, you'll end up carrying cookies and all that kind of stuff. No. It's well, like you might. In any case, you get a signal that you have this connectivity. And having an outside connectivity like that, I mean, doing a call over the internet is not, is not free. It has a privacy implication. OK. So there is a, there is a very different privacy posture between Go fetch information remotely, which means that you will have lots of traces all over the network. And finding in your DHCP server in, or something like that, which is local. Mm -hmm. So there are privacy implications on anything like that. It's, it looks cool, it looks easy, but I, 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 I really don't like the idea that a, a random router can force my host unbeknownst to me to connect to some external website. Okay, so first, it's a, again, it's a may or should, I don't remember what we said in the draft. So you can, if you decide not to go to a website, this is up to the host. You go, you don't go. It's, it's in practice. It's not something that uh, the user is gonna decide on a connection by connection basis. It's either the feature is turned on or it's turned off. And I mean, I dare you explain that to your uh, family uh, that, hey, we have this new knob in the OS that lets you choose between multi-homing and privacy. And I, uh, it'd be better if this was more local. Okay, but so, got the point here. But what's the difference if you receive into a normal array? Please use this DNS server as a recursive DNS server. You will also go to the internet to this recursive server resolver, and basically you will also invade your privacy. Right? That's the same thing. I don't see sending is, a request over not, UDP for DNS and sending an HTTP request. That is not actually true. I can configure my DNS software to always go to a trusted DNS resolver, whatever the network says. Can you explain this to your family member? Oh yeah. You use private DNS. And that way, you will not be snooped off by your ISP. That's, that's very easy to explain. OK. Tommy Polly, so as the author, I mean, thank you for bringing up that point. I think it's good to consider, and we should probably clarify the stuff around that. Um, a couple things. One, like a lot of this is seen similar to what we already do with a captive portal. Um, today, I join a network in general, the system on your behalf does an HTTP probe and it's being redirected and that's how you're getting all this information. You have no idea what's happening there. Um, the goal with this is to try to improve that experience. Um, that the, the resource you're fetching, ideally, um, in a lot of cases, would not actually be over the internet. It could just be locally hosted and probably should be. And the idea is that at least this will be a secure connection rather than the completely clear text probe that your system's doing on your behalf pretty much any time it joins the network anyway. Hey, uh, Dave Thaler, Renzer and I got up at the same time, because so I'm going to segue and let him cover the part that he was going to talk about. Um, the, I was going to sort of rephrase what I think Bob's question is. Um, Bob's question is not about the identification part, which I think is the part that Lorenzo is going to mm -hmm. talk about, but, but, but um, how you get the sort of the bag of properties that you showed. Um, and in order to get that, that means that you have to be able to do things like uh, resolve the FQDN. You have to be able to route to the set of IP addresses that's there. And in order to correctly uh, route to the set of IP addresses and to correctly resolve that, you might need to have the ba that bag of information to make the correct decision. It, which is a little bit of circular dependency, and that's where Bob was coming from. Now, that's the question. If you have a good answer to that, please answer it. But I think that's what Bob was worried about. Is it more or less? 
a circular dependency, right? You can't get the information without already having the information to use in your decision making process. Well, and uh, I mean, I'm agreeing with everyone who paraphrased me. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it's just it's you for this to work the way it's written, and I, you you got to make it so it does one thing, not make it all optional based on how something is configured. And well, it would be not deterministic. But my concern is this is this relies on all kinds of mechanisms to work correctly, or not be subverted or for this and if you you should maybe think about some other ways of getting this information without relying on the dns and the web and routing and da -da 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 -da. And, that, ntp and the csp yeah. i mean it's i uh, so that's a lot of stuff to put in an ra but it's it's not just that it's in an ra it's that you're doing it at all that way yeah, and as whoever was up here before Bob mentioned, it was the, the author is in MIF, right? They were saying, well, let's just put it all in the RA, right? Which doesn't have the problem that we're talking about here, or let's just all put it in a DHCP v6 response or whatever else. It's just embedded all in one place. You don't have the extra dependencies. You just have, you know, whether it's size issues or whatever else. And so that's why you had three or four different ways debated as to how to do it. And this is another way, right? And so now we're beating up on the different problems with this one, and which is the same thing that happened to other proposals too, so. Lorenz Kaludi, I think uh, a couple of points. So, Christian, I think um, you you asked the wrong question, but it, it wasn't. It was close to the right question. Uh, and I think I think the question was not like uh, why does why are you doing this? This has privacy implications. Because in reality, if I'm if I'm a router on the network and I want you to connect to me, I just spoof the DNS response for connectivitycheck.gstatic.com, captive.apple.com, and whatever it is that Microsoft uses, and you connect it to me. Okay, so you know that, that, and let's 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 move that aside. That said, we do need, and I don't think we, I don't think you do, a privacy section explains how this is no worse than current operating systems today. Because I, I do believe that it's no worse because those connections are going out as soon as we connect on very popular operating systems. So we do need to show, uh, if we want to do this, that it is essentially no worse than we have today. Which is uh, a fair statement, yeah. right? So we do have to do that. I don't think I don't we think don't. it's addressed, right? So that that's very important. It is no worse than we have today. It's a very weak argument. Okay. I'd like I'd like that the world in general no, no, goes no, to reason, a better place. So have, let's continue doing something because we're already doing something bad. The reasons the reasons we're doing something bad today are non-technical reasons that are not going to change. Yes, we'll have private DNS. I agree, and this is going to be authenticated, right? But those probes are still going to be there, and they're going to be there approximately forever. Right, so uh, I don't. Uh, but yes, I, I, the, the, like I said, you asked almost the right question, and the question is like, why don't you have a privacy section? And that's the that's I think the right question, because uh, I, I think I think we do need to get this information. As for like being tracked, well, you know, once you you know you can track those HTTP requests, even if in some magic future world where captive portals don't exist, we stop doing those HTTP requests. You can still track the, that someone's on the network by looking at their packets, right? It, it's really like they're there. You, you know they're there, right? So, um, and to respond to to Bob, I think um, the PVDID gives you two things, Bob. It gives you, first of all, it gives you an anchor where you can say, look, this thing exists, and if you if you receive other information. Uh, maybe there's another router on the link that is in the same PVD. Maybe you have existing configuration about that PVD, like a mobile network name, like you know the Verizon network has this host name. Maybe you have some pre-existing configuration, a VPN client or something, and you attach those with that ID, and you have a secure way of, of authenticating them, so you can merge them. And the other thing that it gives you is, yes, the ability to use that ID to fetch things. Uh, the nice thing about putting it here is that the RA gives you atomically, and that's very important, it atomically gives you all the bootstrapping information that you need to, to make this request. It gives you an IP address, it gives you a DNS server, and it gives you this this name that is opt that you can optionally use, even if you even if you use the ID to merge things, you don't have to fetch the metadata. The metadata is there if you want more information about what the network provides, such as is this network metered, or you know, does this network provide access? Is, is it a capture portal? Things like that. So 
it, it, it serves these two things. I don't know if this is explicit in the draft, but it, it has explicit. those two roles. Yeah. Uh, Christian Wittemer again. Obviously, we need some privacy consideration, but I'd like to basically make sure that we also have some privacy mitigations. Okay. Uh, that being said, there is another issue. Okay. What prevents the coffee shop from pretending they are Verizon? Pretending they what? What prevents the coffee shop router from preventing that they, from pretending that they are Verizon or something? So, and this is one reason why we yeah. put the PVD ID there, and we say HTTPS. So you need to be uh, able to serve a certificate with your PVD ID. No, no, that is true. That that I get. That I get. I get that. Yeah. Okay. That. If I go to an HTTPS connection to PVDID, I know that I'm being served the exact information associated with PVDID. How do I know that the router is claiming the PVDID that they actually are? Okay, so to make a long story short, right, because it's in the draft in the security section. So in the additional information, there is the list of prefixes of the routers that can advertise this PVDID. So if you are a coffee shop somewhere in Prague and you pretend to be Starbucks in US, okay, you will of course go Starbucks US, you download the TLS, you get the JSON, you get the router should be this and this and this address. Oh, it's not. Bingo, you refuse it or whatever. Uh, yeah. And there are additional I, techniques as well. I, yeah. And if the well but yeah, yeah. Then, then you have the chain of dependency issue and all that. Kind of, of course, I mean, security is not an easy thing, right? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, that's the goal of presenting here, so comment. So, I am Bob Hinden again. I'm not sure. I, I may be misinterpreting what you said, but HC, as we've learned recently, HTTPS does not mean that who you're talking to is who you think you're talking to. It means that you get a secure channel to it. You know, we saw this thing with the free certs that bad people can get them too. And so I don't think just because it's HTTPS that it ensures that you're talking to the, who you think you are. Okay, we need to talk on this, Bob. I can see Tommy Pauly, Apple again. Um, I just want to tack on to the emphasis that we should look at the kind of the step one and the step two separately, that the primary goal of the step one is to say that when I'm in a situation which I'm getting these multiple sets of RAs and information to begin with, and I have this plurality of information that's provisioning I have multiple previous, I have multiple DNS configs to say that, yes, the network knows what it's doing and that at least within this scope of my access, that these are two different things that are consciously two different things that I can use separately. And that is the only thing you really have guaranteed. The secondary step of getting more information, I believe, and we should probably specify this more, is like all really nice, nice to have things that you should be not making security decisions based on those. Um, they are things such as saying, oh yeah, you, the network is claiming to be a captive portal, is claiming to be a walled garden, is claiming to have these properties as hints to the end host um, to say that to make user experiences better, we can kind of bootstrap processes that would otherwise be based on random redirection, random probes, and very non-deterministic. Um, but it is not a reason to say that, oh yes, on this network, this person claimed that they are Verizon, therefore I'll send all of my, um, the traffic I would send potentially unencrypted on a cellular link directly to them. No, it should not have security implications like that. Ted Lemon. Um, so I actually, uh, to speak briefly to, to that point, um, there are uh, security implications to this in the sense, and I, I imagine, I, I haven't actually read the draft, so I imagine you've already addressed these, but just to, to bring them up to the mic, um, that uh, if, if you're able to say, my service is free, 
or you know my service is really fast then you can't actually convince the the host to route through you when your service actually isn't free <laughs> and uh, and thereby deplete you know like bandwidth or something like that, that that's being paid for by lying so so there is that opportunity to lie and, and I, I assume that you've addressed that but yeah well it's the I am not evil bit right no. yeah <laughs> um, so, 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 so that's a that's a bit of a concern, and, and I'm not quite sure how to address that. The the other thing that I, I, I there's two other points that I wanted to make. One is that in terms of ops, in terms of operations and and dependencies, if you actually want your network to work, you have to make this work. Like it has to be possible to reach the HTTPS server yeah. without knowing the PVD stuff, because <laughs> otherwise it's just not going to work. So, so, uh, so if you set up your network so that so that you have to already know what's in the thing that you're going to fetch with HTTP before you can fetch it, then it's just not going to work, and that's fine. You you just learned a, a valuable lesson. Um, and uh, the actual point that I wanted to to, to make uh, is that uh, one of the things that we talked about in MIF, which I think was actually kind of important, is that it's it's. Um, because we have to deal with the case of, uh, with the use case of um, hosts that don't support multiple PVDs, um, which you know may or may not be most hosts, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, since we have to support that use case, what we had talked about doing in MIF was actually wrapping the prefixes that uh, are not the default prefix in, um, in, in the option, so that a host that doesn't know about the option will fail to parse it. Um, and then they won't they just won't see those prefixes so actually you would have just a general RA the host wouldn't actually have to identify itself to the network as supporting or not supporting this it would just see the RA it would see the stuff in the RA and it yeah, would maybe. so is that something that you guys considered we considered at some point of time and we reject it but I don't remember the reason why we put it on the site so the, 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 one ob the one objection that I see to this is that you actually want one of these on every prefix, right? So, so you have to be able to wrap this inside of the prefix to indicate that this prefix has this PVD ID. And you also need it to be outside of the prefix. And so I could see where that could have been an objection. But I think that that's an easy thing to solve. You, you just have to set it up so that it either can or it, it can contain sub-options but doesn't have to. And then uh, if it's... For the main prefix, you just wrap it in the prefix, and for prefixes that you don't want non-PVD supporting hosts to see, you wrap the prefix in it. So, which is a good, I mean, yeah. I understand the reasoning, but I think Pierre went in the queue, so he maybe knows why we rejected at some point of time. Just, just a small element of answer why the that option was removed at some point. Um, I think it's because one of the reasons why MIF was killed like um, trying to do too much stuff. So I, I have no issue with such a solution. It's just like we would like to aim for a simple solution first, like not try to do everything. And if your use case require your host to support PVD and you want to support non-PVD aware hosts as well, maybe you cannot use this solution yet, but for some other use case, this solution will work. And for the future, we could decide to have another container option for arrays which would do what you want. But put everything in the single document, it's not useful. Like it's just going to make it more complicated. So uh, Ted Lemon again. So uh, I don't think that's actually a good reasoning. I think actually that 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 the ability to say this is a PVD that MP MPVD aware hosts can use versus this isn't is actually probably the most important thing. Um, when you're talking about PVDs. And so uh, as far as, I don't think, like maybe there's some criminology going on about like what happened with the MIF working group. I think the answer to that is is probably less complicated than we imagine and is not what Pierre just said. Um, so I think that we should actually ask for what we want. And if there's a reason why that isn't the right thing, then the consensus process will deal with it. Um, and I, I'm just putting in a plug for what I want out of this option, in addition to what you've already done, is what I just said. Um, and I think that it's eminently doable and very easy to specify. I, I don't know. Uh, anyway. I mean, to come back on the PS argument, we wanted something very simple. Right? To be, they keep it stupid simple. 
this was the baseline of the document. But anyway, we can open, right? So, uh, Dave Thaler, I just wanted to comment on the intersection between uh, two people's comments um, and elaborate on that. Uh, so I'm going to go back. Uh, part of Lorenzo and others' uh, comments were about how uh, actually resolving the information is optional, right? You don't have to do it if you just can use the basic information in the RA or whatever, right? It's, it, you, then you're just using it as an identifier. You're not using it as, as sort of a lookup mechanism. Um, and the other comment was, Eric, when you were responding to the comments about uh, security, well, how do I know that this router is the one that's actually authorized to have this PPD ID? And you said, well, you resolve it. And we said, well, but resolving is optional, and therefore security or actually trusting it is completely optional, and that's why the vulnerability or whatever the Christian is running about would exist. Now, there's a couple things you could elaborate on if you chose to in the security consideration section that says, well, if you've seen this PVID before, but maybe not from this router, and you've resolved it, and then you know which router or which prefixes might be allowed to do that, you can cache that, so not have to resolve it every time you might be operating off of a cache copy. That's the sort of thing that's you know, better than nothing. Uh, but there is a sort of issue to talk about there, which is, do I need to resolve it to know whether I can trust it or not? Am I required to do that? Is security optional? Is security mandatory? And so there's a discussion there, but the notion of caching previous answers is actually something that will help. Yeah, thanks for the caching information. Not, 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 to, not to bear about the point, but uh, just checking the source address mm -hmm. of the HTTP request at the server, I mean, it's so easy to defeat. It's not even funny. Yeah, no, no, no. But if if the client certifying the name is your given. No, no, I, 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 I get that. But what you are saying is that the uh, French Telecom server, for example, will only serve you if you are coming from a French Telecom IP address. I mean, the bad guys can go through that really easily. And there is one thing we cannot really aim. I do agree. I mean, if we could get a solution which is 100% secure, we would go for it. But we know we'll never reach this. So if we can get a, at least to prevent misconfiguration or very naive attack, that's better than nothing. Right now, anybody can send you arrays, and they are little protection, right? Because if you do NPT behind, you don't see it or whatever. I am very skeptical. Okay. Let's look maybe on mailing list or whatever. Tommy, I, I think to the point of the addresses you're validating, it's the prefixes that the router has, not the other way around. In, in the, currently, in the JSON that you are downloading is additional information. You have the list of prefixes that are your PIO that you can accept. Right. So Which is, I think, slightly different from what you're saying. But I mean, back to Dave's point. Um, for kind of like the bootstrapping of the trust. If all you have is the PVD information you get in the RA or the other direct options, and this is just an identifier, at that point, you should not be making any other assumptions about how that identifier is connected to anything else that you've known previously. This is, the only things you would be possibly trying to protect the validity of are the things which are already in that extra information dictionary that you fetch. So there's not really kind of a problem of saying, so yes, if they claim their Verizon, whatever, you don't, that doesn't really mean anything. It's just saying that on this link, this is one consistent set versus this other consistent set of information. So you should not make any other assumptions based on that until you've already fetched it. So there's not the bootstrapping problem because you only care about resolving once you have resolved and you want to say, what do I think about this other information? Uh, Pierre Pistern, trying to give another element of answer to Christian. It looks to me that l what you're looking for is a way to trust your router about what it's telling you. And that's a uh, quite ambitious problem to solve. Like, unfortunately, with arrays and DHCP, they are not secured, so it's complicated. Maybe um, what Dave said earlier is right. and. HTTPS in that example is not a way to make sure that your uh, PVD is what the server tells you it is. Just a way to retrieve the PVD without possibility of man in the middle attack in a modification of the PVD object. But I think in our case, yes, you have to trust your router and the information that it gives you, you have to trust it as well. If you don't want to trust it, well, it's optional. You don't need to use it. You don't need to fetch it. 
David Skenazi, Apple. Um, also touching on the uh, security and privacy implications. Um, I think the, conceptually this is similar to an RA in that all it is is an advisory. In the same way, your RA could give you any DNS server, and as you were saying, you're free to configure your own. Uh, your OS may want to do that, maybe always, maybe sometimes. You're free to absolutely do that. What this tells you is if you want to know a little bit more advisory information, Here's how you get it. And this HTTP query doesn't mean it's across the internet. Your HTTPS server could be like on the router itself or right in behind it. And the idea is, well, you just told me what my prefix was, what my DNS was, what my extra routes were in the RA. Here are a few other related information from there. And also I can guarantee that I am in terminal two dot prageairport.cz if they source it from there, for example. And that's all I know. Like, it's just a string. It doesn't mean, oh, this is my corporate network. Let me send all my data in the clear now. You don't use it for that. Um, uh, Lorenzo Calivi, another thing, uh, another thing, of course, that is, is certainly an option is to rely on a, uh, given that this is, um, partly targeted at devices that might also have multiple interfaces, you can always use another interface to validate this PVD if it's on the internet, right? You you have that option if you choose to do that. And that might be some. The normal behavior indeed, Lorenzo, is to use the PVD information to verify, but nothing prevents an exception though. Right, but you don't you don't have to trust it either, right? So the address check would be checking. You can do the address check on, on the IP address that you got, right? It, it doesn't have to refuse to serve you. It can just tell you, I mean, it, it can it, the thought was that it would just tell you these are the PIOs that you can have. I think that's what, that was what the thought was. That's the point, yeah. Right? And then you would check that. But my point is if something is, you, you, can, have, you can have a model where you could choose to do that. I don't know if they don't know if that's even written there at all, but in theory, you could use a different network to check um, whether that network was giving you something um, that can that can only be verified elsewhere, right? Yeah, you can, for instance, use uh, the VPN PVD through your trusted employer website. Right, anyway, definitely we need to get a privacy section. That's for sure. I guess it would be it would be it might be a useful feature to add to this. You know, maybe maybe if it's not the main way of doing this, I think we we could explore that. That's correct. More work to, for the authors. So by the way, it looks like we have a huge interest and very good feedback. Thanks again for spotting some room for improvement. My ask here: we want to get this work done. Implementation working code is already there. So can we? Get this as a working group document to advance. I mean, there are related works that depends on it as well later, like Captive Portal or others. So what do we do? Or do we create a working group for this? So um, Eddie had, right? So uh, the interior has started to do like one-off items, right? Like, And I do see like a body of work associated with this that's going to happen. And uh, either way, like whichever way you're gonna go, we're gonna get like review from Six Man, like and DHC, and probably like uh, for the Ike stuff, like from IPsec me, right? So I I would really say like you know shooting for a like buff would be like the best thing to do, like a working group would be the best thing to do. But it's really your call. So if you want to like you know request that option, we can do that. Like Wasim and uh, Juan Carlos can uh, sit down and like do another option call to figure stuff out. But um, I think like last time Ted did something like this. It started off in Interia and then went off to MIF, right? Like so, I remember you presented like something about PVD and then it like started work in MIF, right? Uh, I didn't charter MIF. MIF was chartered. I, I understand, but you did a presentation about PVDs in Interia and then went down to MIF to continue to work there. I did. I took DHCP routing out of the charter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, that's a digression. But uh, essentially, the reason why I came up to the mic uh, is that um, this work has been something that the IETF has tried to do for quite a number of years. 
um, the MIF working group was killed off. Uh, I, I don't think that the MIF working group was killed off for any particularly bad reason, but nevertheless, it was killed off. Um, and that's where the work was happening. And that would have been the working group where this work ought to have been done. Um, since the MIF working group doesn't exist, yes, we could have a BOF at the next IETF, and we could, some number of IETFs later, charter a working group, and then that working group could start working on this work. That would be a really bad delay <laughs> for, for no reason that I can think of. Um, so I would really like to discourage that route. Um, if, 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 if what you think ought to happen, um, and again, this is, this is speaking to you wearing your AD hat, if you think what ought to happen is that a working group ought to do this, then I would request that the IASG immediately charter a one-off working group to handle this work. Um, and, you know, we can sit down and, and, and write, write out a charter and do the, do the IAT, IETF consensus process to make sure that the working group is approved. But I really don't want to see this wait for like three or four ITFs just to get to the point where it becomes adopted as a working group document. My personal preference would be to just adopt it here and get the work done. But if that's not okay, then I think we need a working group sooner than next ITF. So um, I did have a ch chat with the proponents like uh, yesterday, right? And with, with the proponents, like the people who wrote the draft and oh, people who are interested. Sorry. So uh, I, I didn't say like, you know, we need to do like a bot to do the working group, right? But but the point is there is different pieces in this document that need to go to different places. Oh, yeah. Okay, like, okay. So, um, if it's getting done in Interior, like as I said before, right, Interior is like not charter to do like, you know, big things, right? It's like one-off things. And the question is whether we think this is a one-off thing to do. And if people believe that's the right thing to do, we can take it up in Interior and get it done and move on, right? And if not, we need to do something more. So that's sure. something I would like the working group to determine, not me, right? But if, if we decide this is like a one-off thing, get it done and no follow-up work, I'm fine with it. I mean, if you want to recharter the MIF working group, I would be 100% behind that. It's not my group, right? Like, but I can talk to Terry sure, and see if he wants to do it. You're, right? you're an int AD. It can be your group. I understand, right? Like, so, but, but we need to figure out, like, what has changed since Terry closed MIF, right, to do the stuff. I, so it's... Well, I don't know. I don't actually know why Terry closed MIF. I have theories, and, and I don't see any point in speculating about it. Yeah, but, nobody knows, actually. So. Mm -hmm. but, but the point is that... that, that uh, you know, I, I think all things being equal, yeah, it really ought to be its own working group, but I don't want us to wait until that happens to do this work. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Um, right. so, and I think, you know, there's uh, you, the cross-area review stuff can happen whether this is done in interior or whether it's done in some new working group. Okay, thanks. Mark, Mark. Hi, Mark Townsley. Um, I agree with a, a large, large part of what uh, Ted said. Um, when MIF was, you know, quickly closed, if I recall, there was a message uh, from Terry that said, and any remaining items that need to be moved forward, I will, you know, AD Shepard independently. And I see this as that work that did continue. I remember meetings um, that happened amongst the authors and other people after the uh, IETF where it was, MIF no longer existed, where we, you know, went, got together and, you know, started working on the what you see here, right? Um, with full expectation that, yeah, if we did a good job and we shopped it around to all the different working groups where it affects, where it, there might be an effect, et cetera, et cetera, we had a path to A.D. Shepard and get this done in short order. Um, I would like that uh, promise to be kept uh, it doesn't have to be by it, it. It's by the internet area. It doesn't necessarily. I don't think anything procedurally says that it needs to be Terry. It could be you. In fact, some other AD could shepherd it. But I would like to see that promise kept so that we can get this work done quickly. If you feel like you need a really short-term working group in order to put some chairs in because you can't scale and you need to have it, um, uh, you need to have a chair there to help manage it. Cool, but creating you know, BOF plus BOF plus working group, and which would necessarily end up like 
opening up all those wounds and like I was there and I did it too and it's already been done. Why don't you do it that way? It would all just happen again. And I'm not sure that helps anybody. To, to Lorenzo's point, we've got line of sight of code getting written in the right platforms. Let's not lose that. Thanks. So Mark, why do you think it won't happen here? Oh, here? Yeah. In Interior? Think, no, no. Why do you think all those like things you said, the bad things, right? Like wounds opening up, like people doing stuff. Like, why do you think it won't happen here? Anything can happen. Right. Okay. I'm not going to sit here and say what will and won't happen, whatever. But I just know I've seen the work that's been going on, and I would rather the people doing the work continue working on internet drafts, coming to hackathons, going around to the working group meetings, making sure everybody's on board, than dealing with you know any sort of you know uh, you know entity creation and destruction in in, in IETF context. That's yes. it. Uh, Shrikunda Valley. I think a couple of points. I think um, this work should move forward quickly. I think if we spend too much of time creating bobs and all of that, that's not going to help. I strongly believe it has a strong relation to some of the 5G work, like slicing. So in that sense, there's a urgency here. I think it should move forward on a fast track. That's my one comment. Second comment on the myth is I completely disagree that this, you know, I, I think, you know, wounds and all of that. Yes, you know, I, I feel that, you know, I also did some part of that. But but one comment is it doesn't belong to myth either because we did a prior, the initial publications were in DHC working group. We just called it class. Somebody didn't like the name. They came out with some structural semantical changes and say it's something new. It's not. The fundamental, the core ideas were introduced much before that. So in that sense, MIF is no longer no not an owner, just that it was structured work. That's the only thing. But so you know, we should close that history, order, forget it, but we should, you know, take up this work in this group in this group and take it forward. That's that's fine. How are you? Okay. Actually, Gauri. So Gauri Fairhurst, um, we have um, vendor code, we have um, hackathon open source code, we have interest in the draft that's been talked about in multiple working groups. And there are probably other working groups like TAPS and the PA, the Pathway Networking Research Groups that could all build on this. I think there's a huge momentum here. That sort of momentum would normally create a working group. If we don't need a working group, then let's just adopt the draft. If we need a working group, then let's adopt the draft somewhere so it becomes an official item to focus the energy and then figure out the working group afterwards. Okay, That's my you. take. Thank you. Okay. Bob. Um, Bob, Bob Hinden, I, I'll only add the observation that it seems like there was a pretty good, robust discussion about this here. So I think that's a good sign for thinking about doing it here. Okay. okay. What's okay. your preference, Eric? My preference, and like most of the author, get it as soon as possible, adopt it somewhere so we can get a real document there. And then we need indeed, there are multiple could be the foundation of more work, so where we can get a working group there. But honestly, don't wait. Right? And for us, I mean, beside the, the privacy thing that we overlook, to be honest, we can finish a document, screw a few uh, screw, and then on we go. Again, the code is there, right? So like Gary said, so. Okay. Okay. Mark, Mark. Totally agree with what, what uh, Eric just said. Let's not forget, though, sometimes we do, I think, an A.D. Shepard document doesn't need a working group, okay? There's no technical, I mean, procedural reason. You have the power. You can take a document and put it straight on the standards track in front of the IESG. Now, again, it's up to you in terms of whether or not you need the hierarchy, you know, in the group to help you do that. But if you feel like you have sufficient understanding of what's going on here, and that you've seen because you know all the authors are running around to all their different working groups and making sure they know about it that distributed approach with you watching very carefully might be all that's needed right and and okay. the way i think about it mark right like whether it happens in interior or if i do eddie shepherd i follow the exact same process right yeah if it's in some other group right like there is a difference right so if it's a six-man document and eddie shepherd like i i go to interior and like the relevant groups but it's an interior. I don't see a difference in in the process at all. So okay, I don't mind things either way, right? Like so, oh. 
Um, uh, uh, how many people have read this draft? Other than the authors. <laughs> oh. Okay, so a uh, decent number. So do you want to do a hum? Yeah. Or? Okay, go. Okay. So if you think that we we should adopt this draft as a working group item, please hum now. And if you think it should go to another working group or even a new one, please hum now. Okay, so the okay. yes have it. So um, confirm on the mailing list. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, next presentation is Gabor in the room or ah, okay. uh, you, you need a pointer? No, I'll change it slightly. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Majus Georgescu, I'm with RCS RDS Romania and um, I'm also the co-author of uh, the draft name MPT, Network Layer Multipath Library. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So, next slide. Please. So, what is MPT? MPT is a Network Layer Multipath solution, uh, which provides a tunnel over multiple paths using the GRE and UDP encapsulation, or RFC 0086. And by extension, is also different from both MPTCP and the Huawei's GRE tunnel bonding protocol. What are the benefits of MPT? So, um, the most important, as with the others, the path through capacity aggregation, uh, resilience to network failures, and um, our contention is it better suits real time traffic uh, than MPTCP. Next slide, please. Well, uh, aside from that, in, uh, MPT can also be used as a router, so routing uh, packets among several networks between the tunnel endpoints, and also as an IPv6 transition technology because the tunnel IP version can be different than the path IP version. Next slide. So how does the stack look like? So we have a tunnel interface that's going to handle the application uh, TCP UDP headers and IP headers. They're going to be encapsulated in GRE and UDP, and then uh, along multiple paths, they use uh, UDP and IP. Next slide, please. Uh, so, as I was saying, uh, conceptually, MPD implements a tunnel over several paths. Uh, the tunnel packets can be mapped uh, different in different ways. So, uh, one of the mappings, and this one uh, we have an implementation of, so per packet based mapping, it can also be flow based mapping or the combination of the two. So the, the packet would look something like that. We'll have the application data, tunnel TCP, IP, uh, TCP UDP, uh, tunnel IP, V4 or V6, GRE and UDP, and then the path uh, headers, uh, which we'll use for. Okay, so the port 4754 and then the IP version of the path. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, of course, we'll have uh, some connection specifications. Um, uh, which can contain several paths, and we'll have some parameters for that. So, um, uh, for example, some uh, some tunnel attributes like name, permissions, uh, tunnel IP version, etc., and uh, number of paths uh, for the uh, path attributes, number of paths, definitions, weights, uh, and so on. Next slide, please. So, in terms of control plane, um, uh, the MPT servers are started. Uh, Automatically, we're using configuration files. Um, of course, connection may be also later establ be established and turned down dynamically. Uh, the paths can be added or deleted, and we also have a keep alive mechanism there. Next slide. So this was a quite big diagram, so we split it into slides. So uh, if a tunnel interface uh, will send the packet, we'll have uh, check, uh, checking connection specification. Next slide, please. And then we'll have the path selection and the encapsulation. And of course, we'll transmit the data to the physical interface. From the physical interface, the data is checked. Uh, can we go back to the, to the previous slide, please? And then uh, because of different delays in packet arrival, we'll have uh, packet reordering. And then uh, the, the packets are forwarded to the tunnel interface back. So, OK. 
So uh, the per packet based mapping, as I was saying, was already implemented. So for each packet, a mapping decision is made. Uh, and since we have uh, uh, weights, we use them for load, load balancing. And uh, the number of uh, PDUs or bytes sent to a path is proportional to the weight of the path. And uh, for this, we have a, a preci precise algorithm uh, which we de uh, described in the draft. And also, there's a sample C code. OK, so this wasn't implemented. This is something that we're planning. So flows are, are identified by the usual five tuple. Um, and then all the packets of a given flow are handled uh, the same way. So the rationale is provide different QoS for different traffic classes. Uh, and we have some samples uh, scenario described. Uh, unfortunately, no implementation yet for that. Next slide. OK, uh, since, uh, as I was saying earlier, packets may arrive because, because of different delays at different times, uh, we have to do packet reordering. So we came up with the order write delivery. Um, and it's based on the GRE sequence numbers. It's done at the receiver. It has uh, uh, to import the parameters, the reorder window, so the size of the reordering buffer, and also maximum buffer delay. Uh, it's working well, it's been tested, and uh, the, we are still kind of, uh, we have still these uh, open questions, like how big should be, uh, uh, should be the re uh, reorder window, and like what's the optimal maximum buffer delay. So these are you know, still being decided. Okay, next slide, please. So there are a couple of uh, academic papers that were uh, written on this subject. Uh, if you're interested in this, please go ahead and read them. Uh, there, some of them are not open access, so if you're interested in reading them, uh, please contact us somehow. Um, so yeah, we, we tested the path throughput capacity and we uh, compared it to uh, MPTCP and uh, we discovered that uh, uh, over eight flows, which was the maximum that MPTCP uh, supported, uh, we have different, uh, or we, we have better performance. Uh, also tested uh, fast connection recovery and the uh, elimination of the stalling events uh, for, for YouTube video playback. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Um, if you're interested in this draft, please support it. So in the academic community, it has already been presented. We would like you to find a home here in the ITF as well. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's all from me. Well, the floor is open for questions. Thank you. Hi, David Skenazi, Apple. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I didn't quite get um, the motivation. What are you trying to solve exactly? Uh, well, uh, we're trying to bring um, a protocol that better suits um, essentially um, live traffic, or it's an, a good alternative to MPTCP. No, 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 but either, like, that's not a problem. Like, why are you trying to use multiple interfaces? Well, to have um, interface throughput aggregation, that's why TCP, MP, TCP. Uh, okay, so, so what you're trying to accomplish is that if I'm downloading, say, or streaming a video, for example, I want more throughput. Is that the problem you're trying to solve? Essentially, if you have like one use case could be like uh, two enterprise sites that uh, need a lot of throughput together, you want to maximize the throughput of each machine, you want to use all the interfaces. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve here. So are you seeing this more as a kind of for like end device host, let's say smartphones, or are you thinking more like for data center to data center? Probably data center to data center sounds more like a better use case. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, David Allen Erickson. Seeing as you use GRE tunneling to establish your aggregate and then you do per packet striping across these um, which is exactly what the, the WOWI informational draft does. Could you sort of go a little further into what you actually think the differences are? Yes, so, um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what exactly were you referring to? Um, well, there's the WOWI draft that also uses GRE um, 
between a pair of proxies and the network to do per packet load distribution across okay. the set of paths and the connection, to use your terminology. Uh, so how are you different? Uh, so essentially uh, per, the per flow mapping uh, probably will uh, once implemented can uh, establish that difference so per, in, in this case per packet uh, yeah well I mean was per, per packet only really makes sense where you have so few flows that you're not going to get good distribution so I'm not sure your use case for per packet and if you are doing per packet, then I'm trying to understand how this is different than stuff that's already documented and deployed. Uh, can you can you clarify what exactly is documented and deployed? Because I didn't understand. I was referring to the Huawei draft. I think the RFC 8157. You're 8157. To. Okay, we'll take a look at that. Thank you. Well, it was in your presentation. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. So, Gori Fairhurst, when we did GRE and UDP, it was one of many different ways of doing this. Is there a need for an interoperable protocol to configure this? Are other people asking for this? Or is it a single vendor? Well, uh, for now, it's just a research project, uh, which was, well, also has some running code. Uh, we would hope to have uh, it developed here and maybe vendors to implement it. Sounds interesting. And um, second thing is, how do you think this relates to Banana and the discussions that went on about the different ways to combine multiple interfaces, tunnels, or whatever? Um, sorry, I, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that question. Oh, sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark Townsley again. Uh, thank you for the experimental results and the papers, and I wish you luck publishing more experimental results and papers. That's all very good stuff for uh, us all to be able to read. Um, you know, there's a hundred different ways to tunnel. You've picked one. There's hundred, hundred different ways to decide how to put packets into that tunnel for whatever use case that you have, and you reach into transport area for sure when you start doing that. It's really fun to see the resurgence of B channels virtualized um, and bonding all over again. If we want to use, um, if we want to use IETF standards track documents, grab multi-link PPP, throw it over an L2TP tunnel, and you're done. You know, it's it's given. You know, now that was all, you know, uh, created in a day where the the links that you're bonding over or balancing over or what have you uh, might have been a bit more um, similar than the say use case of oh 4G and crappy DSL asymmetric kind of uh, bonding, um, but this is mostly a problem of deciding, you know, how the packets go into the two tunnels and come out of the two tunnels. You could use any number of tunneling encapsulations. And like I said, we've already got standards track RFCs for this. So please continue your research. Please continue pub keep publishing. I don't think we need another standards track anything for this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Next item is uh, SOC v V6. Uh, is Vladimir in the room? Yeah. So hi, I'm Vlad, and I'm going to talk about SOX version 6. So um, the motivation behind this is that SOX 5 is 20 years old and kind of needs a facelift. It makes very liberal use of round trips. So it first takes a round, data round trip to uh, negotiate the authentication method that, it, uh, that the client and the proxy are going to use. And then it takes one round trip or more to authenticate the client and then the client asks the server to establish a connection on its behalf. Uh, in the mean, in, after the publication of SOX 5, uh, 
people have come up with ways to do zero RTU authentication. So if two entities had previously communicated, they can authenticate in zero RTTs on further connection attempts. Um, now we have a hot new use case for SOX. Uh, so mo uh, mobile devices are equipped with, uh, with a cellular interface and also a Wi-Fi interface. In case we want to use both of these interfaces for uh, improved th throughput, we have to use something like MPTCP. Now, since servers typically don't deploy MPTCP, uh, uh, network operators have to deploy some kind of proxy in order to uh, terminate the MPTCP connection and open a vanilla TCP connection to the server. Now, since mobile networks have uh, typically have high latency, uh, we have uh, we have made some efforts toward uh, shaving off as many RTTs uh, off of SOX as possible. Go next slide, please. So, um, in order to do that, a SOX, a SOX 6 client optimistically sends as much information as possible up front without waiting for uh, to authenticate with a proxy. So, it sends, uh, it advertises its uh, known authentication methods, the address of the server that it wants to connect to, and also supplies some uh, application data up front. It also can specify whether it wants the proxy to attempt to, uh, step, uh, to establish a connection to the server using TFO or not. Uh, further, SOX 6 is extensible. All, all control messages have TCP-like options, and uh, we plan to implement zero RTD authentication via said options. So, next slide. Now this is what SOX 5 looks when, uh, SOX 6 looks when, uh, like when compared to SOX 5. So uh, in SOX 5, we've got the method, the ne negotiation, the authentication, then the, uh, then the request, and finally the data can pass through. So we've taken the blue bit, the, the, the methods, the, the green bit, the part where the, the client specifies what server it wants to connect to, and the red bit, the initial bit of data, and we've tried we've tried to place them in the initial data exchange, which would hopefully fit into one packet. So uh, SOX 6, uh, so SOX 6, uh, so SOX 6 client sends a request in which it advertises uh, the methods, uh, its known authentication methods, it asks the server to initiate a connection, and it also provides some data. The server then replies with an authentication reply, which specifies what kind of authentication method must proceed. And after the authentication has, complete, has concluded, the server attempts, uh, the proxy attempts to connect to the server and then sends an operation reply telling the client whether the, uh, the connection has succeeded or not. So next slide, please. So uh, what, uh, what I've set up to this point applies uh, to the first connection attempt. In further connection attempts, uh, the SOX client uh, can attempt to do zero RTT authentication, in which case uh, the server replies with an authentication reply and, uh, and requests that no further action be taken. So next slide. So let's take a closer look at what the request looks like. Uh, we've got version numbers, ma uh, a major number and a minor number. We've got, uh, we advertise the known auth authentication methods. Uh, we tell the proxy whether we want to use TFO or not. We tell it what server to connect to. We also include some options in TLB format. And uh, also, and at the end, we place some initial application data. The next slide. The authentication reply is um, the authentication reply basically tells the client whether the proxy needs further authentication or not. So in case zero authentic RTT authentication failed or was not attempted, the server basically uh, the proxy basically tells the client that uh, such and such method must be followed in order to authenticate the client. In case zero RTT authentication succeeded, uh, the server tells the client uh, via which authentication method, it ac actually authenticated the client. Uh, next slide, please. 
And finally, we've got the operation reply, um, which tells the server, which tells the client whether the connection was successful or not. In case it wasn't successful, it informs the client whether it was due to a reset or because uh, the connection timed out or because uh, the proxy did not uh, did not uh, refuse to uh, connect to set, uh, to that server because of policies or whatever other reason. Um, a field that my, uh, that is of, uh, a new field, a field that is of particular importance here is the initial data offset. Uh, this field uh, actually gives the server a, a kind of carte blanche as to how much of the initial data it is supposed to buffer while waiting for the client to authenticate. So basically, if the client sends a huge chunk of initial data, the, the server can choose not to uh, not to buffer it while uh, while waiting while waiting for the client to authenticate. It can just fill that uh, it can just fill the initial data offset field with zero, forcing the client to retransmit the data. Now, next slide, please. Let's look at how uh, SOX six typically op uh, operates in practice. Uh, this is this is how we expect the data exchange to look like on the wire, assuming that uh, assuming uh, that nothing really weird happens and that uh, the, prox the, cl the client and the proxy server are implemented uh, efficiently. So uh, the client starts by uh, starts by uh, initiating a three-way handshake with the uh, with the server. Uh, with a proxy, after one proxy, uh, after one client to proxy RTT, it sends the request along with uh, some initial data for the server. This is when the proxy initiates a three-way handshake with the server. Uh, as soon as that three-way handshake uh, is completed, it sends over the uh, the initial application data. The server then replies. So uh, the total time taken to uh, re for the client to receive uh, data reply from the server is two RTTs, which is no worse than vanilla TCP. So next slide, please. So let's see what happens if we've got TFO on the proxy, on the client proxy leg. In this case, we actually, we get to shave off one, prox one client to proxy RTT. Uh, in case the proxy is on path, this, uh, 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 we, in case the proxy is on path, we have some, uh, we have negative overhead. So we get a data reply in one end to end RTT plus one proxy to server RTT. Uh, this is especially um, advantageous in, uh, in case of mobile deplo uh, deployments because uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the delay at layer, at, the, at layer two is, tends to be high. So next slide, please. So in case we have TFO on all legs, uh, the, uh, the, the initial uh, the, the initial sin hopefully contains both the request and all of the data uh, that the server needs in order to generate a response. Uh, the proxy server uh, does something which could uh, which is roughly equivalent to stripping uh, stripping the request it sends and it sends the, the the application data to the server the server replies and the proxy uh, and the proxy relays that data to the server we, in this case we get the data reply in one rtt this is exactly uh, what we would expect from uh, tfo so we do have an early prototype based on shadow socks some of you might be familiar with it um, it's available at the link uh, on this slide. We, are, we have also written a message library we could, which you can use to write your own uh, clients and servers. And that's it for me. Thank you. Christian Wittemer, uh, I'm sorry I've not read your draft and I, I don't know what you have in the security section, but uh, how do you handle replay attacks? How do I handle replay attacks? Yes. Uh, what kind of you mean replay attacks incurred by TFO? No, uh, basically, well, yes, mm. to some level, but basically, you have a zero RTT process in which you can send 
is initial data. Yes. Those initial data can be replayed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in that case, the replay, what I, I seem to guess is that the replaying of those initial data will trigger a connection to the other end at the minimum, including the sending of data. So I, I don't know whether you have analyzed I mean, what are the downside of it and what the possible mitigation. Well, yes. So, uh, so uh, TF, TFO also has this, uh, the same issues. That's, that is why TFO is optional. The client can choose whether or not to use TFO when talking to the proxy. And it can tell the proxy whether or not to use TFO when talking to the server. Now, with regard to authentication, it basically depends on how uh, the zero RTT authentication is implemented. So if you just use some kind of token, as in TLS 1.3, then you can indeed do replays. Mm -hmm. But if you use some kind of challenge, uh, challenge uh, response authentication scheme, the proxy can just issue like several challenges to the client, and then the client uh, uses the map for connection attempts. And the client uh, should not be allowed to use a, uh, a challenge multiple times. So that, that kind of handles re uh, replay attacks. So yeah, I mean, the, basically, you, you need a, a complete description of that. You know? Yes, well, uh, the, that is outside the scope of the draft. So we do not discuss authentication methods. We do know that zero RTT authentication can be handled in different ways, some of which are prone to replay attacks, some of which are harder to attack. Okay, um, I will read it probably. Ben Schwartz, hi. So hi. I was in uh, I was in your presentation of 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 this material uh, in the MPTCP working group, mm -hmm. and so I had a, a chance to give a lot of comments there. And I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I'm going to re repeat myself a little bit. I also had a little more time to think now. Um, so I want to be both more positive and more negative. So, um, so more positively, I'm really enthusiastic about bringing shadow socks into, into the IETF and trying to figure out a way to basically fix that protocol because shadow socks is a widely used protocol out there. It needs interoperability. There are multiple clients and servers. It does not have good interoperability today. It is not well specified. And this is a big improvement both over SOX 5 and over shadow socks itself. What? Well, uh, the thing is, sh the Shadow Socks protocol actually, when you strip away the encryption, it actually looks a lot like Socks 4. It, uh, it's a stripped down version of Socks 4. We are not trying to standardize Shadow Socks. We just used it to piggyback our protocol. I, I understand that your draft doesn't contain Shadow Socks, but it, it seems like what you've done here is you've, you've identified sort of why they were unable to use or unwilling to use Socks 5 as their, mm -hmm. as their foundation. And you know your proposal is something that that could underpin a future version of Shadow Socks, but it would also be sort of potentially more more compatible with with IETF approach. So I'm mm -hmm. really enthusiastic about that. I'd love to collaborate on code. I'm I, my team is working on Shadow Socks based uh, clients and servers, and we would love to have a better protocol foundation. So, so uh, sure. feel free to shoot me an email sure. anytime. So so I'm very enthusiastic about this from that perspective, but. I also think that this protocol is is extremely dangerous and should not be allowed at the IETF. <laughs> because um, what you've done here is, is you've taken SOX 5 and removed RTT. So why is removing RTT is important? Removing RTT is important is if you're speaking over a high latency network. In almost all cases, high latency networks are not secure networks. They're not networks where we would be willing to trust the link layer with our security. Particular, they're usually over the internet. And if I understand correctly, one of your main use cases here is, is for channel bonding, where you're going through two routes, you're definitely going over the public internet. Um, but this protocol isn't secure, and although you mentioned you can tunnel it over TLS, that's actually not quite true. In fact, I think this protocol is insecurable as specified because of the UDP associated. Uh, there's actually no way to, to set up a crypto context that that handles both piece, the TCP and the UDP side. Yes, well, we only included the UDP associate feature because it was in SOX 5. Right, so, so SOX 5 is also insecurable, 
but SOX 5 is clearly not designed for use over the public internet. SOX 5 is designed for, and, and I, I spent a, uh, a few minutes looking through the history of this, it came out of the uh, authenticated firewall traversal working group. So it was very clear to the people who designed it that it was meant for use inside a, a local network that was not, that did not have access to the internet. So that was a, a trusted network and it was a low latency network. Yes, that was the use case 20 years ago. Right, so so I agree. I really think it's really important to have good standards for proxying and, and efficient proxying out uh, on the public internet on high latency networks. I think this is a big improvement over SOX 5, but I really wouldn't uh, want anyone to to actually deploy this on the public internet because it's it's insecure and also because if we're going to rev a protocol that hasn't changed in 20 years, we should take that opportunity to look through all the all the different ways that we can see if we can improve it. And I think there's a lot more opportunities for improvement. All right. David Skidazi. Um, so I had some comments on the list about like the encoding of the protocol, but those I think we can keep on the list. I don't want to rat hole here about this. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is really good work. Uh, I totally agree that um, SOX v5 needs a facelift. The fact that if you, uh, the use case I use it for is completely unauthenticated because, well, as you were, people before were saying, yeah, it's not safe at all, but if you trust the underlying network, then it's fine. And when you're using SOX v5 in the non-authenticated mode, you have to like do several RTTs to say, oh, I don't support authentication. Oh, good, me neither, let's talk. Not very useful. So SOX v6, you could really streamline and do these things. So I really think there is an opportunity here for solving this problem with the caveats that if you also want to tackle authentication and especially on the white area, that will require much more work. Yes. Tommy Polly, just going off of what David said, he didn't get into. Um, I I agree that, yeah, it's not safe, um, but I think there are now probably going to be more high latency links in which the RTTs matter that are potentially safe or trusted links if you're looking at home networks or IoT type networks. Um, and so this would be very useful for doing proxying there in which we're, you can potentially see latencies now that you didn't see when SOX was originally designed. Mm -hmm. Hi, I just want to, to respond to that. State your name, please. Ben, ben Schwartz, start. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I just want to, to respond to that and, and say, you know, we've, we've been burned many times here for, for trusting the link uh, in certainly in Wi-Fi, over and over, we've we've sort of been told that we have a, a trustworthy link layer, and we've um, and we've learned over and over that it wasn't uh, true. And so, you know, the IETF generally takes the position that we you either need basically IPsec or TLS or a moral equivalent. To clarify Dave Skenazi's statements, by trusted link, we didn't necessarily mean layer two. Like IPsec was what we had in mind. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But this was the last item on our agenda. So, uh, any other questions? No, thank you. And have an early lunch. <laughs> Okay, thank you, and see you in Singapore.